We're going to be talking about this new contact tracing app uh, discussion in a minute. So if you have any issue about that, people were texting in the other day. We covered the story earlier in the week and we want to cover it again because it's a major, major issue over the next few months about whether you would use this app on your phone, whether you would opt into it or not. A couple of texts first though. Feelings in Dungarvan possibly may uh, deliver if you order cash on delivery. Uh, here's a good one. Just want to know and run this by you please, Damien. We're on lockdown in inverted commas. And only essential businesses are meant to be open. Where do cake shops, chippers, Chinese, clothes shops, where have they all gotten permission to open? But yet people are crying out to get their hair and their nails done. Why can't they reopen and do it by appointment, making that only a one-on-one? I'm not one looking for these to be done, by the way. I'm just puzzled as to how all these places have reopened and where have they got the go-ahead to do so. Good point. And we're going to be going to Wexford in a second. So here's a little mention about Wexford. I know we've got quite a few listeners in South Wexford sometimes. Rams Grange Community School in Wexford sent a postcard to every student in their school. My child goes there via the Passages Car Ferry. The principal, Rachel O'Connor, and her amazing team of teachers are doing a great job. I can see the work being emailed to my child and their feedback and encouragement and they're getting from each individual teacher and they're missing their students terribly, the teachers are. So well done to everybody there in that. Catherine O'Keefe, good morning. Good morning. Are you a Wexford person yourself? I'm not. I'm actually in uh, Kildare, but uh, (laughs) my uh, company, Castle Bridge, uh, has offices in uh, Dublin and in Wexford. That's what I was thinking, yeah. There's research there, a director of training and research from Castle Bridge. You're a data consultancy firm uh, based, as you say, in a number of different places and software development. We spoke earlier in the week um, about Nearform, the company down in Tremor, who is developing an app with the HSE, a mobile tracing app for COVID-19. Can you tell me, please, what's your thoughts on this? We don't know the details yet. Obviously, the Nearform and the HSE are, I suppose, doing this privately. We don't know exactly how this is going to be rolled out and what's going to contain within it. But what's your thoughts on it at the minute? Well, there, I've got a few thoughts. Uh, one of them is it's very difficult to uh, describe what exactly Nearform and the HSE are doing because they have not been at all transparent. Like you said, they're being very private about it. Uh, there's been globally a lot of debate on the uh, possible benefits and risks of a contact tracing or proximity uh, notification, exposure notification app. Uh, and so we, we you know, Castle Bridge have been part of that discussion over the past few weeks. And uh, one of the things that uh, we need to be very aware of is it's not a silver bullet. At the best, a working contact tracing app uh, would be a tool supporting human contact tracing as part of a coordinated response with rapid testing, tracing, isolation, and treatment. If you don't have that, you end up having uh, some possible worst-case scenario risks. Uh, you have a possible building up of a surveillance database, which you don't know who's using that data, what for. You have a potential overwhelming of the healthcare system with false positive notifications. Uh, and you also have the possibility of people feeling uh, a false sense of security because they have this app on their phone, which could put people at greater risk of exposure, thinking that they're safe. Yeah. So we need the transparency. We need to know what the process is going to be, uh, you know, uh, what uh, in the business we call the data protection impact assessment, which is again describing what the process will be, who's in charge of making decisions around the data, who has access to the data, identifying what some of the risks could be and how we're going to make sure the worst case scenarios don't happen. Um, we don't know the details, as we said, of how this is going to work, Catherine. Are, do you think it will more than likely be a Bluetooth type system? So, for example, if I have my app open, and have it working effectively and all the location devices are are set and open on that and I'm passing by you on the street or you stop to have a chat with me at the park and you have the app open, will it be able to tell me that you are you don't have COVID or how how is it going to work practically, do you think? Uh, yeah, so there's a, a few possibilities using Bluetooth, and currently Bluetooth is the uh, most likely option. Um, and just a bit of a health warning on that, the inventor of Bluetooth has already come out and said that, that he's not actually sure that it's going to be uh, an accurate enough proximity measure because it wasn't designed for that. Uh, but yeah, uh, basically, if you're looking at that, you've got the Bluetooth, noti- Bluetooth uh 
a, a signal on various phones if it's turned on, if there's an app on it. Uh, and uh, the uh, potential, you know, basically each phone would have an identifier that uh, would record a uh, you know, proximity to another phone there. Uh, that would either be kept on the phone or uh, in a central database. That's one of the questions there. And then if somebody was confirmed to be uh, COVID positive, then you'd have that uh, register of people or phones that had been close to that phone that would then be notified. How that would be done, that's kind of one of the questions there. Uh, you know, how are you determined to be COVID positive? Do you, uh, you know, uh, identify yourself that you have particular symptoms, or do you get a test and it's officially done? That would be a humongous difference accuracy-wise because COVID-19 yeah. symptoms, you know, depending on what you're looking at, are very similar to a lot of different other conditions. Uh, Can so I ask you? In the UK, it looks like they're doing a self-reporting because they don't have the testing capacity, from what I can tell. Yes. Uh, so that, that, that could be a problem if we do it similar to the UK. If, because we have a lot better testing capacity than the UK does, we do it with uh, you know, official uh, testing, uh, you know, if you're positive, that gets put, and then other phones that have been close to you get notified that they need to contact a human contact tracer. That could be a much better way to do it. It really depends. And what we have at the minute is other countries have been trialling different aspects of how these systems could work, particularly those in, uh, in Asia. Um, what do we know about systems that are just starting to work already? Well, this is one of the things we're all trying to roll out new technology uh, with that has been untested. We're not sure how, you know, that it works at all. One of the first con- countries to do the Bluetooth contact tracing was Singapore. And one of their big issues was that only about 12% of the population downloaded the app. And you need to, from what we can tell, have probably at least 60% of the population using the app for it to be anywhere near possibly effective. Uh, but again, this is all untested, and that's one of the uh, worries that people have is that we are throwing a lot of hope into something that we have no idea whether or not it will work, how it will work. Do you think there will be a lot of people worried about data protection? Um, one of the things you need to consider is that data protection is not just looking at privacy. It's looking at uh, making sure that you uh, consider the possible risks to our rights and freedoms when it comes to processing our data. And yeah, I think a lot of part of that is privacy. I think a lot of people are worried about privacy because when you are putting together a record of you know, who you come into contact with, that's pretty invasive. We balance that against uh, the uh, risk of becoming ill and having you know, a serious health crisis when we say, okay, that's a reasonable risk to take in consideration. Um, so people may not be necessarily considering it in the words of data protection, but people are concerned about what happens to their data, and they are constantly trying to make trade-offs of, is this risk worth it for this benefit? Um, definitely mm. people who are used to thinking about how data is used, what we use it for, they'll definitely be concerned about uh, you know, questions of the security of the information, who has access to it, what is it going to be used for after uh, so you know, if you look at the other issues that we've had considering you know, people's information, things like the public services card, a lot of people don't trust the government to necessarily be very clear with what they're doing or have their best interests in mind. So they'll be less likely to want to download an app that could track their you know, uh, proximity to other people, their network of people that they come into contact with. So that, that's a concern, not just in the question of, uh, you know, is the government going to be using our data in ways that shouldn't be, but also in the, the efficacy of the possible solution. I think, Catherine, we're at the embryonic stage of a massive development in technology and how governments will ask and possibly force people to use technology. And we haven't even mentioned the fact that some people don't have smartphones and how they may well be excluded and might well be penalised. Uh, you could see in a few years' time people being forced to do this. We just don't know. We just don't know. Um, yeah, that, that's like that question of people not having smartphones is an important thing. Even yes. if everyone is completely willing to put this on their phones, the people least likely to have a smartphone and the, the ability to download a new app are probably going to be in your highest risk demographics. Yeah, the, the, yes. Uh, you know, 
slow, the, the smallest amount of smartphone ownership is the, the uh, people who are cocooning right now because they're high risk. So we need to make sure we're taking that into consideration when we build our solutions. Very good point. Catherine O'Keefe, thank you and uh, the very best of luck. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Catherine O'Keefe there, Director of Training and Research from Castlebridge, the data consultancy firm based in Wexford and in Kildare. Um, we'll continue this discussion another day. It's a very important discussion, as I say. It's the birth of a new style of technology and how technology is going to be used. And I'd say we're going to see a massive proliferation of this and also how people respond to this. Anybody who's ever watched Blade Runner and one of these, any of these futuristic movies, we're beginning to live in it, folks. It's beginning to happen. It's happening already. And how people respond to it will be very important. Anne has texted us in to say... She phoned in, actually, to 0518461123. Can you please find out who is responsible for signing the letter requesting that consumer rights be eliminated retrospectively with regard to flight refunds? I feel this was an underhand act that the public deserves to know who did it and whether all parties were aware of it. A Dungarvan caller has called to say she was just coming out of town and she spotted a French car pulling up at a B&B. Are B&Bs operating across the city and county and the country? Uh, This car had a roof rack and was obviously travelling around. Also, I want to ask as well, is anybody due to have students um, from Spain or from France or from Italy into their homes or into uh, their vicinity in the next few weeks? We've heard stories that, uh, you know, the way the annual influx of students from abroad coming to learn English. uh, Is it happening this year? Somebody from Tremor was uh, onto us saying that it could well be happening. Just like to know if it is, please. Anybody, any uh, thoughts on that? Frank has texted in to say Dunstore's clothing department is open all of a sudden. How is that happening? What's the story with car tax, says another texter. I can't go anywhere in the car and it could be another month idle. As far as I know, the government hasn't made any decision regarding car tax as a general amnesty. But what you can do is, in the normal procedure, if you're not using your car, you can contact the tax office and say you haven't been using it for a certain amount of months and ask for a refund on those particular months. Uh, Bill has texted in to say that uh, he doesn't believe that all teachers should be still getting paid the full amount of pay if they're at home. And other people are saying teachers are doing a great job. Thomas texted us in from Dungarvan, from one of the hardware stores there. And hopefully we'll be able to get a cash on delivery for that lady. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. A very good text. Damien, do people have to reapply for the extra three months on the mortgage or does it carry automatically? I don't know. And we'll find out. We'll try and find out about that. Another texter, Liam. I can see people in their 70s walking around Dungarvan in the evening. Um, uh, that's, that's Some of them are, some of them aren't. Another caller, a text message to our WhatsApp message. I'm a barber in Tremor, and this is in relation to the text area about barbers or hairdressers going back. If I was to go back to work, I could cut four people's hair in an hour. That's up 30 plus people I would be in contact with every day. If I was to do that by appointment, say one an hour, that would be about eight. I wouldn't even cover my wages and I wouldn't get the COVID-19 payment. And I still wouldn't be comfortable coming into close contact with eight people every day. I understand people's frustration, but barbers and hairdressers health matters. That's very, very important. Good morning. Can you remind people who are insisting on exams going ahead that some students are immunocompromised or live with families who are? We are both in that category as parents and the pressure on our daughter is immense. As if she contracts the virus during exams, it would be detrimental. We need a choice here. Predicted grades for those who want them and those who don't can sit the exam. Now, isn't that a very, very good suggestion? So predicted grades for those who want them and those who don't can sit the exam. This is a very serious threat to health at this stage. Thank you. I hope you can read out this text. Good advice there. Good suggestion. Now, um, over 70s, the Silver Brigade, you can call it. uh, We want to hear from people who have separated, not during the COVID crisis, obviously, but if that's happened as well, let us know, please. 83 975 You can text in. We won't read out your name if you want. And the question we're going to be asking is, what are the seven key facts about separation or divorce after long marriages? When an older couple divorces, perhaps after many years of marriage, uh, marriage, 
Theories and rumours may swirl around as to what has happened. Some people separating after maybe 30 or 40 years of marriage. I spoke to somebody in their 80s there recently uh, who separated. In your 80s, is that a bit late to be separating? Is it ever too late? Let us know, please. We're going to be talking about that next. As I said, we're going to be talking about separation or divorce after long marriages. If you want to text us in, please, uh, privately. We won't read out your name. If you've had experience of this, if you have any questions about it, if you have any thoughts on the matter, please text us in. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Uh, please thank Danny and Brian Power and Cheek Point Stores for all the deliveries in the area. Well done, lads. Uh, good morning. Why are some people driving alone wearing face masks? Um, is this right? Is it silly? Says this person. Another caller wants to know, <laughs> how do you get rid of bats? They're swooping around at dusk outside her house and she's terrified of them. How do you get rid of bats? Well, bats have, uh, they're, they're protected as well. You can't get rid of them. Margaret asks if any shops in Waterford have wheat germ. She's also tried all the bigger supermarkets but can't get any. Another texter asking about nail and hair bars uh, in town in Waterford City or Dungarvan. She thinks there may be one possibly open in Waterford City. How can this be true? Is it true? Are there any hail or nail bars, nail bars open? Let us know, please. 083 33 975. And the staff at Fenner National School and Preschool keeping in touch. Special hello to everybody there on that. I'll get to more of your texts and comments in a little while. If I don't read out any birthday texts, I make sure that... Um, Jeff will read them out later. We want to say a special congrats to Robin Whelan and CJ O'Brien on their baby girl, Sophie, last night from Granny Peggy, Granny, Paggy and Nanny and Patrice. Ah, that's lovely. Congrats, Robin and CJ on the baby girl, Sophie, last night. Bernadette, good morning. Good morning, Damien. Sorry, I just took a gulp of water there. <laughs> gup, 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 gup. Good morning to you. I hope you're staying well. We're good, thank you. We're good. And thank you so much for joining us. You're keeping good yourself? Yes touch wood. <laughs> very good. Um, you are our relationship counsellor and thank you very much for talking to us. The topic we're going to discuss, which uh, I was talking to a woman in her 70s the other day about this, and she was remarking about somebody she met, a man in his late 70s who separated recently from his wife. Hmm. And he's grand. He's fine. There's not a like he's, he's kind of like a, a new man again. And right, yeah. she was asking me about, I wonder, do men get over this or get through this quicker than women? Is there a generalised thing on this or is it just down to the individuals? And I just said, that's something we should talk about. Um, right. What's your, what's your initial thoughts on the matter, Bernadette? Well, my initial thoughts would be, um, you know, there, there is, had, was some research done some time ago on separation and divorce uh, in the States and the difference between men and women, regardless of the age, right? Okay, so um, men tend to tend to get on with things, um, but in 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 many in many cases, it was found that after about two years, they literally had kind of replaced their their partner, their wife, whether that was through divorce or death, you know. So whereas women tend not to do that, and often people say, "Ah, oh, well, you know, now nobody's going to be bothered with you now," but actually, they sort of can transform the whole situation and they tend to to take a different direction in life you know because generally speaking women tend to be more reflective now that doesn't mean that men are not reflective but you know there is a difference in how both cope with it so she could be right in that yes he's just getting on with it he's grand you know but I think as well you know after a long long marriage and you know somebody who makes that decision which is never an easy decision at any age Maybe it has followed a life of quiet desperation and unhappiness. And the actual freedom from that is probably... Because that constant unhappiness... People maybe stay together for the sake of the children and wait until they are reared and all of those kinds of things. But it has a, an effect, and particularly for men, actually, it has an effect on their physical health. You know, it, that causes stress levels and raises blood pressure mm. and heart problems and all that. So some people can feel physically and mentally better and fitter after they leave a long-term unhappy situation. And again, I met a man in his 80s last year who had separated after nearly half a century of marriage. And uh, I, I kind of said to him, why did you leave it so long? Like, why did you... And you kind of think, if you're in your 80s, now again, 
people are living longer. People are living up to 100, maybe a bit longer. You think, oh, yeah, I've got 10, 15 years left in my life. I want to make yep. sure. But you kind of think at that stage in your life, ah, come on, you know. Well, yes, but then I think, I wonder, Damien, is there a kind of an existential element to this? You know, as people get older and they realise that, that life is actually finite, you know, it's about what, what will my life mean? What, you know, when I'm on my deathbed, will I be saying I, I lived a meaningful life? We probably won't be thinking of the money we made or we didn't make and all that sort of thing, you know. I think particularly this current pandemic has made us realise what is actually important to us in our lives, you know. So that can be that I need to 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 figure out who I am, what I am. I've lived always as somebody's wife or husband or mother or, you know, playing all these different roles. And it may be that they want to find out the meaning of their own life, you know. Yeah. Um, I think as well, in, in the States, actually, you know, uh, divorce amongst the over 50s has doubled since the 90s. And in fact, divorce amongst the 65 plus has tripled. So I think there is a sort of a sense of, of the end of the road is nigh. I haven't done the things I need to do. I've stayed in a very unhappy marriage for, for whatever reasons. And now I need to live whatever is left of my life in a meaningful way for me. Mm, you know? I'll, I'll, I'll go through the seven key facts about that in a, in a minute. But I want to ask you a simple question as well. What about a man who has been mollycoddled by his wife for half a century? and can't cook for himself and might be able to use the toaster if he's doing well and suddenly his marriage is over and he's in his 70s, he, he, he could be completely at sea, completely lost. Uh, true, he could. <laughs> you know, maybe now's the time to learn. Like there's the cook. practical things at that stage, you know, you kind of, huh, are you going to start learning to cook when you're 76? Well, yeah, why not? You know, I mean... Again, until recent events, 70, it was, it was starting to be considered not to be that old. Now I'm sure the 70-year-olds feel everyone's projecting age onto them, you know, with their cocooning and all the rest of it. But, you know, I'm, I'm conscious as well that we're talking about, in a sense, what will men do after their marriages? What, what do women do? You know, women decide to leave marriages late in life as well. Of course. You know? That's I the next thing I was going to say. I think what happens sometimes too is that um, retirement can have a, an impact, you know. So, Say the man that you feel that may feel that he's been mollycoddled and because he's been out earning the money and uh, in that kind of a, a role, and then w- retirement comes and he can be at home all the time and and really they, the couple discover they don't have much in common, you know busy lives have kept them apart, and now that they're together all the time and it, quite often actually it's it's women that instigate divorce because. Again, as I said, they tend to be very reflective. They tend to they tend to take care of the relationship. They tend to notice when the relationship is missing things. And whereas sometimes men are happy enough to go along and sort of say, sure, everything's grand, you know. Um, so, but yeah, I'd say at any stage, I mean, it depends on why the couple have split up, you know. Um, yes. Sometimes divorce in later in life can be less acrimonious than, you know, all of the all the trials and tribulations that go with like children and you know dividing up assets and the house and all that kind of thing both can kind of come to a an agreeable uh, situation where they go yeah you know what we we put up with each other for long enough. So uh, I know yeah. it. De- it depends on the individuals. Depends on the case. Like a text from a lady: I separated after thirty four years of marriage, divorced after thirteen years. Our children were adults. Life is never the same. Family occasions are still tough. It's sad yeah. when two people with children, grandchildren, can't be friends. Uh, I know my other half doesn't like me at all. I feel very sorry for him at times. Another text her in saying it's disgraceful. People divorcing in later life. When two people get married, they become one and should stay together forever. And you mentioned some of the facts about divorce after long marriages. And one of those is that when a long marriage ends, the siege of marital failure may have been sown decades before. And children will struggle with the reality of a parental divorce, whatever their ages, uh, yeah. which is exactly what you're saying. There also can be positive outcomes, Bernadette, in late life breakups, can't there? Yes. Well, as I said, you know, many people live lives that are imposed on them, you know, particularly maybe say they get married young and they do all the things that society expects of them. They get married, they get a good job, they buy a decent house, they raise a lovely family. But it may not necessarily be a true reflection of who they really are, you know. And I do think and I do believe that for all of us, you know, what what are we here for? You know, what, what does our life mean? And it's our responsibility to live the life 
that we, 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 not so much that we were meant to, li- to live, but, you know, to use our, our talents and to use our creativity and to live life in a, in a mindful and meaningful way, you know. Again, I think the current pandemic has brought that home sharp to people. We're all running around busy, you know, chasing, chasing what, you know. So it can bring that sense of I've done my duty, I've done my responsibility to my family, to my partner, and now it's time for me. And in later life, people do discover things like, you know, creativity they may have left behind. They may, they may return to become an artist or a writer or whatever. You know, I, I often say to people who feel kind of stuck in life, you know, what makes your heart sing? And follow that, you know. So it can, it can really lead to a lot of transformation and change for people. Um, yes. And as you say, people are living longer. Um, and, you know, at 70 can say, well, I've got, I've got a, a, a good lot of years left. How do I want to, how do I want to be in those years? You know, so. OK, and so to return to my initial question, yes or no, do men get over it quicker than women? Do men get over it quicker than women? I would probably say yes, because they tend to be quite rational and they get on with the practicalities of things. I know there's a lot of people listening to this now in workplaces or otherwise they'll be discussing this. They'll be talking about this now and they'll be saying, yeah, do you you know this person? There is one thing I'd like to add, Damien, you know, that can be maybe a very negative reason why people get, Mm. get divorced in later life. Their own ageing and their partner's ageing and maybe uh, illness coming in and all of that. And sometimes, um, and let's say particularly men, tend to kind of run away from that because it reminds them of their mortality and they go for a younger model <laughs> so that they won't, they won't, they feel they won't have the burden of that. You know, so I'd say to, to, for anybody thinking of separating, really, really, really look into the whole situation because it also, it has its advantages, but people can be quite lonely and isolated later in life and finances also come into it. They can be less well off in their 70s and, and going yes. forward. You know, it's, so it's no a grounds for divorce? Ah, uh, no, just separate rooms. Okay. <laughs> as long as you cuddle each other when you, before you go to sleep and wake up in the morning. <laughs> like the Victorians. Uh, Bernadette, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Damien. Thank Take you. Care. Mind yourself. Thank you, Bernadette. Ryan there uh, is snoring a grounds for divorce. Uh, Joan has phoned in to say some husbands aren't able to cook or do any household jobs, but they can walk out the door, try to get with someone else, and it's amazing what suddenly they're able to do. Um, Keep your texts and comments coming in. I'm in a second marriage, uh, so I'm happier and better now. I get on better with my ex-husband, yet my second husband's ex-wife remarried, but is bitter. She, it's so sad that she can't move on, and it's very, very difficult with grandchildren events. Uh, Dunn stores being reopened. Tesco's have been open all along, and they sell clothes, says Deirdre. Can you please say a big hello to the working staff at Glore Namara. I think the guards are doing a very good job, says this texter, uh, with people that are disobeying the regulations. And mischievers of fifth class in, in, in Stephen Street sent cards to all her class, as well as the children. They were all delighted. I want to say a special, special happy birthday as well to Betty O'Carroll and Comera Green on her, from her best friend, Mary Hartley, Laura and Frank. Keep your texts and comments coming in. 083 975 We're going to be talking about homeschooling in a minute, particularly those that have learning disabilities like dyslexia. It's going to be, it's extra tough. Firstly, a couple of texts regarding car tax. A caller says if the car tax is up in May or June, you can declare it off the road for a period of time so you don't have to pay tax for those months, but you can't do it retrospectively. No way to get a refund. So that's very, very important. Anne says regarding over 70s getting divorced or getting separated. um, Years ago, she'd go to hospital for three days. Her husband had to fend for himself. Their daughter brought him to the supermarket. He didn't even have a clue how to get the trolley. They give out to her for doing too much for him. And a lady said her parents are divorced for 35 years, but her mother is still using the marriage name. Is that allowed? They've been to court. And Bernadette rang in to say to the over 70s, never mind the begrudgers. You only have one life. Lead it. Owen texted in regarding the bets and Paddy Power. He said, shop winnings at paddypower.com to claim the cash if you want to get through on that. Another texter, when will Fair City be back? Please, 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 can you find out, says this texter. I don't know, and somebody might be saying hopefully not for a while. Uh, good morning, Siobhan. How are you? 
Morning. Thanks very much for joining us, Siobhan O'Neill White from mams.ie uh, on homeschooling. I know there's a lot on the website about this and advice mm. for people. It's very tough. Any child, any parents, a child has learning disabilities like dyslexia can be extra tough. Um, the figures are startling in a way, aren't they, Siobhan? Yeah. One, in, one in ten children in Ireland. Yeah, one in ten. And then you have other issues like dyspraxia and there are so many different you know, issues on the learning scale, I guess, that children can have. So now that we're homeschooling and if you, you know, if your child is quite young, um, so our daughter who has dyslexia is 12. So we are, hu- we're spending a huge amount of time with her every day, trying to get her through, you know, the work that's been assigned to her from the school. And, you know, I actually had to contact the teacher because there was, there was just so much work and some of it is difficult for her. And I contacted him and I said, she's really stressed. She's not getting through it all. We're really stressed. And it just felt like in the situation that we're in, we all have so much to deal with and we're all trying to be calm and we're all trying to be healthy. And a heap of schoolwork every day for a child who struggles with certain things was really creating a lot of extra stress. So the first thing we did was speak to the teacher and he said, look, don't worry if she does 60, 70 percent, that's fine. Don't be worrying about doing everything. So that's the first thing I would say to parents. If you feel overwhelmed or if your child is overwhelmed, contact the teacher and just say you're struggling or your child is struggling. We've enough stress going on right now without adding extra stress onto our lives. And you don't want your, you know, children are hearing bits of news. They know things are going on. So as much as we can turn off the news or try to protect them, they're aware of what's happening. And obviously they're not allowed to play with their friends. So they have a level of anxiety anyway that they wouldn't normally have so we need to be a little bit kinder to them I think and not put additional pressure on them at the moment It's a very very good point yeah um, what other little bits of advice would you give for people because we've had a number yeah. of people with children with autism and other um, learning difficulties and it is just so difficult now the fact as well that we're looking at another two weeks of yeah. relative heavy enforcement of uh, well a minimum uh, a minimum yeah. two weeks because it's I don't see how it's all going to magically fix itself in two weeks' time mm. um, when you've got people out in groups, still out in groups on the beach and there's a holiday home park down the road from us. It was jammers on the Easter Bank holiday weekend. I expect it will be the same this weekend. I hope not, but it probably will. So we're not, we're not through this by a long shot. Um, a really, really good investment that you can do for your child if they've any kind of a learning disability, any kind of issue with spelling, with understanding words, uh, reading, you can buy what's called a reader pen, a scanning pen. This pen is a genius invention. Your child is reading a book and if your child has any kind of a learning issue like dyslexia, they will struggle to understand certain words. Even small words can be difficult. Sometimes they'll see the word in a different way. For a really good example is if my daughter see the wor- sees the word was, she will read it as saw. She sees the letters the wrong way around. So this little reader pen, it's an electronic pen, and what you do is she rolls the pen across the word and the pen reads the word out loud to her. And if she doesn't understand the word, if it's a difficult word, it, she there's a little button and there's a dictionary and it gives her a dictionary meaning for the word. So when she's reading and she's getting stuck with certain words, she takes out her pen, rolls it across the word, gets the correct spelling and then gets the meaning of the word. So that's called a reader pen or a scanning pen. Uh, There's only one place in Ireland I think you can get them and that's a company called CompuPack IT. There's a guy in there called Brian. He's really helpful. He helped us a lot. So if you're going to buy something like that, you want to be able to speak to someone who knows how it works and who you can ring up after the fact because I've rang him a few times to ask him different things. You want somebody who'll give you a proper level of service. Um, Dyslexia Association of Ireland likes this pen as well and we think it's really good so that's CompuPack IT you can get a free trial on it as well and Super. what it does apart from you know helping your child figure out a word rather than us kind of micromanaging her all the time we can we can kind of back off a little bit and say right read that paragraph there or read that short story there and we'll come back to you at the end and she's using her pen and it's given her independence and that will help her confidence. It has helped her confidence. So it takes off a little bit of the pressure on us to be constantly over her shoulder. Um, And also another thing that children with dyslexia tend to do is they skip words. So if they're reading something and they don't understand a word, they just skip it. And then the whole paragraph will have a different context. So if you, again, leaving her with the pen, she's not skipping words anymore. 
So I'll give you a really good example. She was reading David Walliams books and she was skipping words. So she wasn't getting a lot of it. So we got the pen. She start even at night time, she's sitting in bed, she's reading her book, she runs the pen over the word and she's laughing more with the book now than she was previously because she's not skipping words and she understands it better. So you're giving them, I suppose it gives her a little bit of independence. So yes. anything, you know, homeschooling is very, very difficult. The We have four children. The amount of work they're given, and I understand teachers don't want them to fall behind. I completely get it. But parents, most of us are not trained teachers. So it is difficult. And, you know, they learn maths in a different way than we would have learned it in school. And, you know, you're sitting there pulling your hair out going, that's not the way we used to do it. So it can be um, quite stressful. Yesterday, we got an email from our daughter's school, the older daughter, saying she hadn't submitted um, one or two assignments. And I just thought, I felt really hounded by that because she's doing her work. She's putting a good few hours in every day. And I contacted school and said, I've got four kids. We're trying to homeschool them all. We're trying to get through this time. You know, if there's one or two things not done, I don't think that's the end of the world. So I I did get a little bit defensive. I thought, Mm. my God, they're following me up on one or two little things. She's submitted heaps of work, trying to stay on top of things. And that's, that's the... Parents are feeling quite stressed right now. We're feeling like there's a huge amount of work on us, on our shoulders to keep everything clean. Go around cleaning the light switches, clean the door handles. You know, when you go out, don't talk to anybody, don't touch anybody. You come back, you're trying to keep everything safe for your children. And then the homeschooling, the volume of it can be overwhelming. So I'm saying... If it doesn't all get done, you know what? Don't worry about it. It's okay. Take a deep breath and tell the teacher, listen, back off a little bit if you you need to do that. I know there's a lot more on the website. Siobhan, thank you so much uh, and mind yourself, okay? My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. O'Neill White from mams.ie M-A-M-S mams.ie If you have any more questions about dyslexia go on to that website and there's a lot more information on that. Mary Rang from Kilrossen do you say there's snow on the mountains and tomorrow is the first day of summer um, and also those reader pens you'll have a connection there Dyslexia Association or mams.ie full of beans have wheat germ says this texter. Car tax can be done online it's not one of the things you can leave till after COVID-19 and a text in from Brian about VH they're upping the premium increasing from 1,900 to 2,100 for his wife and himself 12% increase we receive approximately 356 rebate but we pay an extra 470 euros so VHI are not actually giving a rebate in my opinion what do the listeners think send us in your text 083 333 975 now I'm going to be talking to Deirdre Cal from Waterpark College in a second. We had a little bit of Love Me, Love My Dog by Peter Shelley playing under some of the ads there. I don't know how that happened. That was in advance of a piece we're going to do. We're going to put it off until tomorrow because we want to have proper time to talk to Lindsay Power from In the Dog House regarding separation anxiety for dogs. Uh, good morning, Deirdre. Good morning, Dean, and lovely to speak to you. And thanks for helping us now promoting our well-being event now next week. You're very welcome. We won't have too much time to get into all the different aspects of well-being. I've been talking to other teachers about it this morning. We also wanted to give Water Park College in Waterford a nice bit of publicity and to say well done on the fun well-being co-video message that you've done. Uh, at least 5,000 likes on Facebook at the minute. And effectively, it's uh, the toilet roll team, I suppose, kicking the toilet roll from one teacher to another in their garden. It took a lot of work, I'd say, to get this together, did it? Yes, yeah, as you say, yeah, the, uh, we have been running this. Uh, this toilet roll now has been rolling and passing on from one member of the team to the next uh, for about the last, I suppose, all, all, all told, maybe about three weeks um, Damien, we had started it off with a Zoom meeting with staff, you know, we when in one of our staff meetings and basically, you know, I threw it out there, you know, would people be interested in making a video because I had seen something from um, Ferrybank, you know, from uh, the college over in Ferrybank and they had sent a lovely well-being message out to students before the lockdown. So when we found ourselves, you know, in the 2K, you know, it was a good opportunity to say, look, what can we do, you know, that shows that we're all connected. We're all, you know, um, at home um, making the most of what we have. Yes. And we want to, you know, reach out to students, have a bit of fun and say, you know, we are here and we're, you know, we just want you to see that uh, life is going on in the new normal. But, um, you know, um, uh, have a look at this and it'll certainly, as our principal said, put a smile on the faces. 
Yeah, it is one of the main problems for well-being, particularly for your, your principal, Joe Hagen, Joe Hagen, Joe Hagen, um, Hagen yes, yeah. uh, is because he's a Leeds fan and he had Leeds on the toilet <laughs> roll and Leeds are now maybe not going to get promoted if the leagues don't finish. And I, I think Joe's well-being has to be catered for. Uh, and all Leeds yeah, fans. We will have to make a lot of provision for that, you I will. imagine. Definitely, Damien. There'll be <laughs> a lot of support and interventions put in place to help Mr. Hagen. But uh, I, I think um, Mr. Kiley picked up uh, his, uh, his, his message there. <laughs> when people look at our video, you'll see, you know, the teachers were very well coordinated, you know, because they were talking to each other, some of them in pairs, you know, and uh, as you do, and, uh, you know, saying, right, when, when I pick up your Leeds uh, piece of toilet roll, uh, Mr. Hagen, well, uh, it does go down well with me so we'll kick it on to the next one so yeah you know these are these are all the messages that the kids understand very yeah, well they do. You know, because they know they know us better than we know ourselves sometimes you know and uh, you know it's great uh, that they you know when they when they do see things like that uh, they'll say oh you know there's so and so again you know doing doing whatever you know whatever our interests are whether they're tennis or you know uh, you know it, it does kind of connect us all back up We only have two minutes left and I'm sorry for the short amount of time but in That's terms right. of Wellbeing Week I know all the students and students from all other schools have got notifications from their parents and from their colleges regarding Wellbeing Week and what's happening next week so I suppose you've put in place a different strand of Wellbeing initiatives because of people being at home now, haven't you, Deirdre? Absolutely. And look, I just want to say, Damien, you know, we would have been running our Wellbeing Week next week and it all kicked started there a few years ago with a team of teachers, um, Lisa Fitz, uh, Fitzgerald and with Natasha Ryan and Maureen Creamer, you know, who got an amber flag for us and started Wellbeing. Now, we have Wellbeing right across the year and, you know, it's in the classes all the time and in our relationships in our relationships with our with our colleagues and, you know, with our kids. But the focus is more on it now, I suppose, and we're being more effective. But our Wellbeing Week would it be next week and so we're running things as normal. I want to say we're having a, 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 a Zoom meeting with Dr. Mark Rowe he came to our well-being last year to talk to Leaving Certs and he'll be there again this year. And, uh, you know, it's a different format. We're doing things differently, you know, but we're doing what we would have been doing to a certain extent, you know, um, running fun activities. And, you know, we would have been walking in the park and we would have had a lot of exercises going on, you know, for, you know, physical well-being and, you know, uh, let's say looking at mental and spiritual, you know, we have, you know, a lot going on there with meditation and, you know, telling the kids about, you know, yoga practice practices and all the rest. So look, we're hoping to put, we'll post those resources up now to um, a team and um, the kids can look at them and, you know, do them at home, you know, uh, and follow it and do something for their well-being as much as it'll be resources for staff as well. But we certainly are looking forward, as I said, to the um, uh, to the event with Dr. Mark Rowe and we're hoping yes. to roll it out next Wednesday at 12 o'clock and we're inviting our Leaving Cert students to talk about, you know, any kind of concerns they have, as, as you know, they do, you know, um, with getting their, their um, um, I suppose, their routines back into yes. running up, break, back up and going. And, you know, thing, you know, if they have concerns about sleep or diet or, you know, he's fantastic, as you know. And, um, you know, so we're delighted to be hosting it. So, yeah, Super. looking forward well to the Wellbeing Week. And thanks for plugging it. Not and at we all. We want to encourage everyone to get out there and, uh, you know, organisations and schools and do and something do similar to us and like us on Facebook. Exactly. Deirdre Cahill, Wellbeing Coordinator of Waterpark College. Thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot, Damien. All the best. Thank you very much there. Thanks very much, Deirdre.